Shabbat Shalom again to everybody. Hope you had a good break. And as we said before the break, for those that are online with us, we're going to carry on with Shemot chapter 32. As we're looking at when Moshe broke the, the two stones that, that Yahweh had given him. And as, we, as I was just sitting here before we started, I was just thinking, you know, when Moshe came down and he said, in the displeasure burned, his displeasure burned. I mean, he was angry. You know, he's putting it politely here. And he threw the tablet out of his hand at the foot of the mountain. And I thought this is such a powerful witness because when remember when in Shemot 19, before Yahweh spoke the words, Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet with Elohim and they stood at the foot of the mountain. So they stood at the foot of the mountain and they heard the words that Yahweh spoke. Now he comes down, they're playing, and he breaks the very words that they heard Yahweh speak written on the stone at the foot of the mountain. So it was a witness against him. You stood here, you heard his word, you broke it. Boom. You know? And then we took the golden calf and he ground it up, burned it in the fire, put, made it into a powder and scattered it on the face of the water, and he made the children drink water. You know? In all of these images, we actually see a picture of that which will happen um, or what would, what would happen when Israel would commit whorings with the nations. They would be scattered over the face of the earth because this is, again, he scattered the dust over the face of the waters because, again, it's a picture of idolatry and knowing that that which has been made from the dust of the earth, so to speak, and scattering it over the waters, the waters represents the nations prophetically. And so we see Moshe making a clear act, a prophetic act, number one of those that were going to die then, but also a clear judgment against those who do not listen to the words of Yahweh and have not because... When he brought them to the foot of the mountain, that was after they were told to get ready for two days and on the third day, and, and he spoke to them and brought them to the foot of the mountain. So this is a, a very clear warning still today that those that are not listening to, they might claim to want to be the bride of the Creator. But if they are being let loose by saying we don't need the Torah, they are going to drink the cup of judgment. You know, They didn't want the pure water of Elohim. They were playing. In Chazon 2, verse 20 to 23, it says, I hold this against you that you allow that woman, Isabel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and lead my servants astray to commit whoring and to eat food offered to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her whoring, and she did not repent. See, I am throwing her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great affliction, unless they repent of their works. And I shall slay her children with death, and all the assemblies shall know that I am the one searching the kidneys and the hearts, and I shall give to each one of you according to your works. So we see that when you don't listen to Yahweh and you give yourself over to Hori, you are risking affliction from Yahweh, great affliction, he says, and knowing that he's coming to give according to your works. That's what Israel got here, those 3,000 that dies. They got according to their works. They worked disobedience and they got the punishment for that. You know, Yirmiyahu 25, verse 27 to 28, and it says, And you shall say to them, Thus said Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, Drink, be drunk, and vomit. Fall and rise no more because of the sword which I am sending among you. And it shall be when they refuse to take the cup from your hand to drink, then you shall say to them, Thus said Yahweh of hosts, You shall drink. So here we see a powerful picture of that which we will drink. And I always see this clear picture. We remember our master's death at Pesach meal when we have the cup of remembrance and we drink of that cup. So you either drink of that cup in obedience to his feasts and keeping his Torah, staying in him as a bride that's received the instructions and not broken them, or you will drink the cup of his wrath when he comes. And we, when, when you worship in any other way that's contrary to what's been commanded, when you mix your worship, when you muddy the waters, no matter how sincere you are, you will drink the wrath of Elohim. And that we also see in Chazon 14, verse 9 to 10. It says, The third messenger followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark upon his forehead or upon his hand, he also shall drink of the wine of the wrath of Elohim, which is poured out undiluted into the cup of his wrath. And he shall be tortured with fire and sulfur before the set-apart messengers and before the Lamb. So when we see this picture of Moshe coming down and breaking the tablets of stone, it's a shadow picture of the first coming of the master when he came and he had to be broken from us, came from above, he is from above. And he says, 
the only one who ascends is the one who's come down. So he came down to be broken for us. And we see a clear picture that now when he scattered the dust over the face of the waters, again, it's a picture of that our master's death is sufficient to call anyone back. But you either drink of his cup in remembrance of him and the suffering that he took, or you drink the cup of his wrath. So you're going to, that's why when, when, when Yahweh said to Yirmiyahu, if they say to you, no, you say, you will drink. The, the clear fact that we see in the pattern of scripture is you will drink of a cup. Which cup do you want? I mean, the obvious answer should be the cup of redemption, you know. And so when we see here the first set of tablets, as we discussed earlier, never went into the Ark of the Witness. And that's symbolic of the heart or the tab of the tabernacle. We always spoke about how it goes from the heart of the tabernacle outwards in the function and the, the pattern of the service of the tabernacle. And so we see here a powerful picture that when the new tablets that Elohim also wrote upon and went into the Ark of the Witness, that's symbolic again of Shavuot, where now the spirit of Elohim writes his word, the very same words on the tablets of our hearts. And while Aharon tried to claim innocence, he said that the people brought him gold, and I always love, I mean, we joked about it earlier, but, you know, oh, no, they brought it to me and it just popped out. And that's how many people are making the same, same mistake today, is that they don't want to take responsibility for their actions. You know, we need to come before the master and realize that we cannot hide anything from the master. And when Moshe came... Remember, Moshe is coming now from the presence of Yahweh, so you already had to have looked a bit different. When you're in Yahweh's presence that long, being fed, well, well, he didn't eat or drink, so it was a supernatural miracle already. And now coming, and you'd think that this point, that you would, that that presence of Yahweh in Moshe, it, Aaron would have, should have kind of been open and honest, but he still tried to cover up, you know. And as I said earlier, you know, one of the lessons that we can learn is that Aharon had not yet been anointed. And we also see that he probably, under the pressure of the people, I, I do think, as Colleen said earlier, it, with Yahweh relenting, it's not like he changed his mind. It's a picture of allowing Moshe and Yehoshua to see through his eyes that they had been in the presence of for 40 days and 40 nights what he sees, as opposed to being at ground level and trying to think you can see everything. Now, they had, in a sense, Yahweh's view. They got there, they when they saw. got there, they saw this. Because at first he says, get down there to your people who you brought out. And it's Moshe's like saying, my people, you know. <laughs> but when he got there and he saw it, that's what caused him to break the tablets because he could finally see what Yahweh was seeing. You know, and I think the only way we can see what Yahweh sees is when we are spending intimate quality time with him. You were saying earlier how you read, 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 and then suddenly it's like something stands out. Where, why have I just overread it all this time? And it's, and it's not that you haven't seen it. It's in its right time. Yahweh reveals more of himself. You know, and this is where we realize we need that progressive revelation that happens so that we are not left to our own devices. Because if it didn't happen that way, people could think, I've read it once, I don't need it again, and then they carry on. But it shows you how important it is to go through, as a collective bride co together, go through the Torah each week. Because a lot of, there are a lot of Torah groups. So we, I know today we sa uh, said earlier about, okay, well, let's maybe move closer to home. And, you know, we've talked about where we came out from. We've done it for years. But what about on our walk now? What's happening? You know, and there are many Torah groups that say, oh, we've done the Torah portion. We've done that cycle. Ugh, no, we passed that, you know. And I'm thinking you're missing the heart of the instructions of Yahweh. As we continue in this pattern, revelation progressively get, gets more and more. So that when you get to other parts in Scripture, they are easier to understand, you know. I mean, the rules in a house stay the same. Yeah. But as you grow up, the way you view it or the way you do it changes. Yeah. You know what I mean? The rules stay the same, but the more mature you are, the more depends on then how it yes. applies to yeah. you. So we can't just say, okay, I've heard it once. No. You heard something you were two years old now, by the time you're 16, and if you have never heard it again, you're not going to remember. No. I mean, when Yahweh asks a, a, a vital question here in verse 26, and he says, Who is for Yahweh? Come to me. He was basically saying, who is for Yahweh? Come and follow the Torah. And that's the same question that's being asked today. 
Who is for Yahweh? And that's the same question Eliyahu asked on Mount Karma. If Baal is master, serve him. If Yahweh is master, serve him. You know? And so Baal, meaning master, husband, or landowner, so it's basically saying if Yahweh is Elohim, serve him. If the Lord is Elohim, serve him. And so we, we don't know our master by titles alone. There are specific titles that express his characteristics, but we know him by name because we're a bride that's intimate with the bridegroom. And that's a relational walk, you know. And Moshe asks, and as I said earlier, that the Levi responds. This is a picture again as a clarity of the righteous standing up with a sword of truth in their hand ready to fight the good fight of the belief and just stand for the master. This was a clear picture. Who is here to stand for Yahweh? Take your stand. And after having done all, keep standing. And that's what's being called for us today. Stand firm in the truth. Do not let pressures rock you from your position. If your feet are firmly planted on the rock of our deliverance, then you are able and equipped to keep standing. And that's what we see as we look into the next chapter where Moshe wants to see the esteem. He says, here is a place with me in the rock. This is where we are able to keep standing, you know. In verse 33, it says, And Yahweh said to Moshe, Whoever has sinned against me, I blot him out of my book. Because here we see 3,000 people dying. It had to be a shock to this nation. In one day, 3,000 people being put to death by their own brothers. So this wasn't a plague in the camp. This was Yahweh through Moshe. Moshe coming down and saying, who is for Yahweh? Standing up and they say, right, go and, who would they go and kill? It might be as we go down the line in the, in the Torah, we see with the cup of jealousy that when a woman would drink and if her belly swelled and she wasn't, didn't give birth, then you, you know, it would show that she had adulterated herself. You know? And so it could be that those when everyone had to drink, of these waters, it could be possible that there was a, a bit of a sign on some that were put to death that were not being faithful. And here was a way to identify. Because a lot of people say, no, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. But Levi had to go and kill 3,000 people of their own people, you know. And obviously, as every time we read this, we think of these tablets being broken, people dying after drinking the cup of wrath, then we think of the cup of the Passover that we have at the beginning of Matzot and counting the cost to Shavuot, where Shavuot we remember and celebrate what happened on that day when 3,000 people were added to the body. As a clear witness again of a renewal of the covenant, not the words of Yahweh, but of a covenant that man broke. You know, And so whoever has sinned against him, will be put to death. And we see similar language right through Scripture in Tehillah 69. It says, Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. And Yechezkiel 18 verse 4, it says, See, all beings are mine. The being of the Father as well as the being of the Son is mine. The being that is sinning shall die. I like that passage because it's uh, present continuous. So, at the end of Chazan, it says, let him who is filthy be more filthy. In other words, you want to continue that you, you, your, 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 your outcome is going to be death. Where the being that is sinning, it's not that the, when you, we've all sinned and fallen short, but that does not mean that we will all die. And when I say die, I mean the death of the unrighteous. Because it's appointed for all men to die once. But those who are part of the second resurrection, the second or first resurrection, the second death has no power over them. So though the being that is sinning shall die. It's it's a, if you read Yechezkiel 18, it talks about again when one who is sinning turns from his wicked ways and turns to the master, all that that she did in the past is forgotten. But the one who's been righteous in the day that he sins, all his unrighteousness is forgotten. So when you are sinning, it implies that you have not repented and turned away from your sin. His righteousness is forgotten. Sorry, thank you. So we, we see a powerful witness here that if people are going to continue in lawlessness, Yahweh's making it clear they are going to die. You know? 
But those who hold fast to the truth and obey the commands have the assurance of their names being written in the book of life, as in Chazon 3, verse 5. It says, He who overcomes shall be dressed in white robes, and I shall by no means blot out his name from the book of life, but I shall confess his name before my father and before his messengers. So you either get retained in the book of life or blotted out of the book of life. You know, because our master is the author of all life. So everyone that's been born is because he's allowed that person to be born because he is the author of life. And their names are inscribed as creation, that which has come forth from the one who creates. But when you don't obey him, your name is blotted out. Because on 20 verse 15, it says, if anyone is not found written in the book of life, he is thrown into the lake of fire. So not only is your name blotted out, that means you don't have life, your, your punishment is death through fire. Not like in the flood when it was death through uh, waters, but even those that died at the waters are still going to stand up at the judgment and face the fire. You know, so the day of his visitation, and that's where we see in verse 34, it says, lead the people to the place which I have spoken to you. See, my messenger goes before you, and in the day of my visitation, I shall visit their sin upon them. Here is the root word pakad used again. And it's the day of his visitation, you know, the day of Yahweh. When we see in Chazon, the day of Yahweh, it's relating to the day, the millennial reign, the time that he comes to establish his reign and separate the righteous from the unrighteous, the clean from the unclean. And in Amos 3 verse 14, it says, For in the day I visit Israel for their transgressions, I shall also punish concerning the slaughter place of Beit El, and the horns of the slaughter place shall be broken, and they shall fall to the ground. Now, the horns represent strength. The horns of an animal represent its strength. The root word for horns has the meaning of shining. It's that which beautifies the animal. Okay, so the horns of the slaughter place represented the strength of the slaughter place. And he's saying the slaughter place of Beit El will be broken. In other words, I'm going to break down your strength. You that think your slaughterings that you're offering to me will be destroyed. Beit El is, is a picture of man-made worship because it was at Beit El that Yaruvan built a golden calf. And then he also set, he made two. And he set one up in Beit El and one in Dan. And later on, Yahweh calls Beit El, Beit Aven, the house of sin. And, it, and uh, in Romans 2, verse 2 to 6, it says, We know that the judgment of Elohim is according to truth against those who practice such wrongs. And do you think, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such wrongs and doing the same, that you shall escape the judgment of Elohim? Or, you, or do you despise the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of Elohim leads you to repentance. But according to your hardness and your unrepentant heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of Elohim, who shall render to each one according to his works. Now, how do people read that in the, in the renewed writings of New Testament and think that the Torah is not long, no longer applicable? When he's clearly speaking of the judgment of Yahweh that's coming. You know? So the plague as a result of disobedience that came and destroyed the people and Levi had to put to death their brothers and sisters and family is a clear picture that there still remains a day of visitation and we are presented with a choice, life or death. Anybody want to share their thoughts before we jump to chapter 33? Some of them are puzzled by 32, 33 and 34. First, Moshe is saying, Forgive them, or please forgive them, otherwise block me out. And then Yahweh says, whoever has sinned against me, I block him out. So, has he listened? Has he listened? And I'm just a little confused by it. Okay, what he's saying to Moshe, because Moshe is kind of like, listen, Moshe is shocked at what he saw. Because at first Yahweh says, get down, these people are whoring. No, no, but please, how are you going to say, remember Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, you promised to them, and it's a picture of the intercession of Messiah. It's a picture, when Moshe saw what's going on, he was angry. He threw the stone tablets on the ground because now he saw what Yahweh saw. Now he's basically saying he's still as intercessor. He still has that heart of intercession. He says, but listen, if you would forgive their sin, please. He's saying, if there's any way that you can forgive them, but if not, then please block me out as well because I'm no different to them. It's like when Yeshiyahu saw the presence of Yahweh after hearing what's coming, and in Yeshiyahu 6, when he saw he put his hand on his mouth, he said, Woe is me of unclean lips. 
So Moshe is basically saying, block me out of your book as well, because I'm, why am I any different? You know, and, and he said he very clearly here, he separates. He says, the one who has sinned against me, I blot him out. So already a separation. So he's saying, I'm not killing everybody. Because Moshe thought, okay, now you're going to destroy everybody and I'm going to be left alone. Because Yahweh already said, I'll make a new nation with you. But he said, I don't want a new nation. I want the people you've told according to covenant. So it's not, is he, isn't he? He was making to Moshe. So he was basically reestablishing Moshe. You I'm not blotting out because you haven't sinned against me. But the one who sinned against me, I'm going to blot out. So that was the 3,000 or was it the whole of Israel? No, it was of the, the 3,000 that died. Then the plague still came. And the plague still came. So it was a clear witness and it still is a witness. Anyone who sins against Yahweh will be blotted out because that's what he's establishing because as Kaleem said earlier, Yahweh knows the end from the beginning. This generation that was counted didn't make it in except Yehoshua and Kalev. Again, to the promised, the promised land. land. Or, but not necessarily blotted out. Not, not well, why would they not be blotted out? Because so. if, yeah. if, well, if they wouldn't be blotted out, they would have got into the promised land. The point of our lives is to spend to go into the promised land with Yahweh, into Yahweh's presence. These guys didn't. It's yeah. a picture of rejecting so his presence. They fell yeah. before they got to the promised land. Mm -hmm. It's the same for us. If we don't do what he says, we don't get in. Yeah. So they didn't. And then when you don't get in, that's a picture of the end judgment where you're blotted out because it's like he gives each one according to their works. So they'll all still stand, but they'll be blotted out because they'll be shown you didn't enter in. <clears throat> no, no, he didn't. Because of the rebellion of Aharon and Moshe when Moshe struck the rock. Sorry? Yeah. Again, when we get to that part of the portion, we explain the ramifications behind that. But was there still room for repentance for the people? Wilderness. No, well, while they're in the wilderness, yes, because here, as they journeyed, they had a choice. Mm -hmm. So it shows us by, it's not, like it's not like they were declared that day, you're all out. It's a clear witness saying, if you sin against me, you're blotted out. So that's the same word we get today. It's a warning. So they received one judgment was 20 years or older, you're not going to reach into the promised land. I guess in that walk from that point onwards, they could, have made right. they could have, but they, but it shows us they didn't. Because, I mean, they would have, everyone has an opportunity to repent. I think by the, by the time Yahweh said, nobody of this generation is entering. Yes. He saw their hearts here already. Yeah. And he said, I want to block them all out because he knew they were going to carry on through the wilderness. I'm going to give them all these opportunities and they're going to keep rebelling. Yeah. That's the, that's the mystery of him knowing the end from the beginning. Mm. Even knowing that, he still gave them so many opportunities, but they just proved what he knew from the beginning. We also see that at the time of Messiah, because yeah. Messiah kept knowing this one who would betray him. Yeah. Although he had not been received up into esteem yet, he was still in the flesh, but he knew this is the one that will betray me. But, I mean, but even from that point on going forward, I mean, they sp he still spent years yes. teaching them the way and walking, and this is how you do, this is how you serve. Uh, so they still kept the Sabbath and they still walked all yes. through his ways. Because even, even with Yirmiyahu, when the nations will come and say, our fathers inherited life. Because, listen, teaching even these rebellious lots still in the following Yahweh, they, they had to impress it upon their children. So they became almost like religious Pharisees because they're impressing it on their children, but they're not living like it. And so it doesn't mean, okay, well, it's almost like we mustn't get caught up in a predestination kind of theory where, okay, we Yahweh knows, but anyway, let's let them go because I'm not. We can't see what Yahweh sees. For a moment in time, Moshe saw what Yahweh saw. And he made it, but obviously Moshe now, in still in not understanding the fullness of Yahweh, standing and going, well, if everyone's blot out, just blot my name out too, because what's the point? But he says, no, no, no. The one who sins against Yahweh, and this is where it's Yeshua comes along and he says, you can sin against him, the son of man, and you'll be forgiven. But sin against the set-apart spirit and you won't be forgiven. Again, it's that understanding of <clears throat> you can come, <clears throat> sorry, 
from a place of ignorance, a little child, a babe, and not understanding, and you're kind of kicking against the thing, but like Shaul says, he's kicking against the, the prods, you know. But now coming to a place where you should know better, a, a, an age of maturity, so to speak, and you should know better, but you're still choosing against, that's, that's a clear witness of judgment against you. So Yahweh was just making it clear, whoever was not um, found in the book of life means they've been blotted out. And then we go to Yirmiyahu and we see, what does this mean prophetically? When Yirmiyahu says, those who forsake the fountain of living waters, their names will be written in the earth. And when Yeshua, with the woman in adultery, and he, wrote, and he bent down and he wrote their names in the ground, those that were accusing the woman, that's in part fulfillment as a prophetic witness of Yirmiyahu and what we're reading here today because you're either written in the book of life or in the earth. Now being written in the earth is again a picture of dust to dust. There's no ashes to ashes in scripture, okay? I know they like that saying, but it's dust to dust. From dust you came to dust you return. It's a picture of you're not entering into that eternal life. So you're either written in the book of life. Well, as I say it like this, everyone has a record of their birth because Yahweh is the creator. But you're either then blotted out and written back in the earth because you go back to that which corruption has come from, or you are sealed in the book of life and you're given a renewed name, which only you know because it's a picture of that renewal that you will enter into the reign if you stay in him. So the standard that's being given to Moshe here that Yahweh is saying is, obey me and you live, disobey me, you die. That's a clear presentation of that. We'd like to read chapter 33. <laughs> And just before, who's reading, Jackie? Just before that last verse makes it clear. Yahweh plagued the people because of the calf they made. You corrupt your worship, Yahweh will plague you. It's, that's, that ties in with Devarim 28, 29, around there with the blessings and curses. You know? Okay. Chapter 33. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Come, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Mitzrayim, to a land of which I swore to Abraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov, saying, To your seed I give it. And I shall send my messenger before you, and I shall drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Yebusite, to a land flowing with milk and honey. For I do not go up in your midst because you are a stiff-necked people, lest I consume you on the way. <clears throat> and when the people heard this evil word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. Should I go up in your midst for one moment, I shall consume you. And now take off your ornaments, and I shall know what to do to you. <clears throat> so the children of Israel took off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. And Moshe took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the Tent of Appointment. And it came to be that everyone who sought Yahweh went out to the Tent of Appointment, which was outside the camp. And it came to be, whenever Moshe went out to the tent, that all the people rose, and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moshe until he entered the tent. And it came to be, when Moshe entered the tent, that the column of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tent and spoke with Moshe. And all the people saw the column of cloud standing at the tent door, and all the people rose and bowed themselves, each one at the door of his tent. Thus Yahweh spoke to Moshe face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Jehoshua, son of Nun, a young man, did not leave the tent. And Moshe said to Yahweh, See, you are saying to me, Bring up this people. But you have not made known to me whom you would send with me, though you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my eyes. And now, please, if I have found favor in your eyes, please show me your way and let me know you so that I find favor in your eyes. And consider that this nation is your people. 
And he said, My presence goes, does go, and I shall give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence is not going, do not lead us up from here. For how then shall it be known that I have found favor in your eyes? I and your people, except you go with us. Then we shall be distinguished, I and your people, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Even this word you have spoken, I shall do. For you have found favor in my eyes, and I know you by name. Then he said, Please show me your esteem. And he said, I shall cause all my goodness to pass before you, and I shall proclaim the name of Yahweh before you, and I shall favor whom I favor, and shall have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he said, You are unable to see my face, for no man does see me and live. And Yahweh said, See, there is a place with me, and you shall stand on the rock, and it shall be, while my esteem passes by, that I shall put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I shall take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Okay, as I said here, Yahweh said to Moshe, come up from here, you and the people who you brought out. <laughs> he's like identifying, listen, this isn't the people I wanted to bring out, you know. He's like, <laughs> you know, because my people listen to me kind of thing. And they're identifying themselves as not my people. I mean, it's, uh, but Moshe, he's basically saying, and he says to him, listen, I'll send my messenger before you and I'll drive out all the ites, you know, in the land flowing with milk and honey. I don't go up in your midst because you are a stiff-necked people. What he was saying is, if I go in your midst now, I'm gonna, you, you've just had a plague that has killed. You, your Levites stood up and put to death, and you've had a plague. 3,000 people have died. There's been a, you know, but if I physically come into the camp now, the whole nation's going to be obliterated. You know? And this is a, a powerful picture that we see here in this chapter. And Yahweh said to Moshe, the children of Israel, say to them, you are a stiff-necked people. Now, most people who, be, who like to think that they're believers don't like to be told you are disobedient and stiff-necked. You know? And he's telling them for good reason, because he said, should I go up for a moment? I'm going to destroy you. Now, take off your ornaments, and I'll tell you what to do. In other words, strip yourself of that which you think identifies you as my people. In other words, come clean. You know, and they took off all the ornaments, and then Moshe took the tent. Remember, the tabernacle has not yet been built, so the tent of appointment, Moshe's tent, he'd have to take outside the camp. And you'd go outside the camp, and him and Yehoshua would go. And when Moshe came back, Yehoshua stayed in the tent. There's another picture, as I said earlier, about Messiah being in the in the most set apart place. You know, inside the camp, it was not pure, so Moshe had to take. His tent, which was the tent of appointment. And later, the tent of appointment is identified within the tabernacle as the dwelling place. Okay? So for now, until the tabernacle was built, Moshe's tent of appointment was outside the camp. Yeah, because otherwise Yahweh yeah, wouldn't meet with him. He wouldn't meet with him, you know. Because he wouldn't come into the camp. <laughs> yeah. And so we see a, a powerful witness here of Moshe basically now... This is a, 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 for the camp, this was a bit of a new way. Well, firstly, they saw Moshe entering the cloud on the mountain, coming, taking long, let loose, playing, seeing destruction. Now Moshe takes his t tent outside and they see and they watch Moshe go there. You know? And you so when, when you see him coming back, and they must think, yes, what is going on here? When they see Moshe going to the tent, and coming back and his face is shining and they can't look upon him and everything else. And it's like, this is a, must have been quite a unique thing for them to experience. But as Moshe is talking with, with Yahweh, I mean, we're going to look at the face shining just now. But when he looks and he's, it, we are told clearly in this text that Moshe spoke in the tent with Yahweh as a man speaks to his friend face to face. There's a lot of people that like to try and say, no, it's metaphoric language and it's everything else. No, this is clear language and we need to understand and know right from the beginning. Yahweh walked with Adam and Chava in the garden. And Yahweh appeared physically to individuals all the way through. You know, Hanoch walked with Elohim. He revealed himself to Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov. You know, he appeared to Shemuel. 
You know, so we see many a times, and with Moshe, he spoke with Moshe. They would sit in this tent like we are sitting here today looking at each other, and they spoke. What an awesome event, you know. I think this is such a powerful thing here. And in a desperate seeking, you know, Moshe says to Yahweh, you know, I want to see your esteem. And Yahweh says, you can't. In the form of a man, yes. face to face, yes. he was in the form of a man. He, was, he yes. said, I want to see all of you. I want to see who you are. I want to see the full. Remember, Yahweh made man in his image and likeness. So therefore, Yahweh has a form because he formed man and fashioned him to be and look like him. So in order to walk with man, he manifests, in a sense, himself in this form to relate to his creation. But now Moshe, yes, it's like speaking here, but okay, I know who you are, but I really want to see who you are. I want to see the fullness. It was not the glorifying Yahweh's face. No. Because I think the conclusion comes in verse 20. Yeah. It says, he cannot see my face. Yes. Yeah. So it was not Yahweh's majesty that he saw. No, he saw Yahweh as we are speaking now. Man to man. And he saw him as we would see him as Yahushua. Yeah. In the form of man. Now to see his, let me see your face. It sounds, this is where it sounds weird. You know, it's like, because then he says, um, I'll, call, pass all, I'll cause all my goodness to pass before you and proclaim the name of Yahweh before you and I shall favor whom, whom I favor and have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he said, you are unable to see my face for no man does see me and live. And this is where people are saying, hold on, this feels weird because he spoke Yahweh face to face, but no one sees his face. And really it is no one sees the full countenance of who Yahweh is in the fullness of who he is beyond creation. Because we can't embrace that in our sinful state, you know. And so it might be confusing at the beginning, but then he still says, Yahweh says to Moshe, there is a place with me. And he says, you shall stand on the rock and my esteem passes by while I put you in the cleft of the rock and I cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I'll take away my hand. You'll see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So in other words, what Moshe was wanting to see is I want to see you as sovereign, as creator, because I'm talking to you like a man, which literally they were. He'd been in his presence for 40 days and 40 nights, supernaturally sustained. So he knew, this is how I've been relating to you. Now we're kind of tight. I want to see actually what's behind you, what's everything about you. You know, you need, we need to understand that. And the esteem, the word for esteem, kaved, means weight or burdensome or to be heavy or respect and honor. He wanted to see the full weight of who Yahweh is. That's really what's being asked here. And when he says, you cannot, cannot see my face, what he's saying, you cannot see me in the face of the fullness of who I am. How you can see me is the way I've been able to be presented to you. And that is in the form of being in the rock. And that rock, Shaul says in the wilderness, is Messiah. So we, Abraham saw Yeshua Messiah. Yitzchak saw Yeshua Messiah. Moshe saw Yeshua Messiah. This is how we as a people embrace Yahweh in our ability. Now, I would like to spend some time, and I know, because this is, the esteem of Yahweh is very important for us to understand. Prophetically, going all the way through to the revelation of Messiah. The Hebrew word for place, makom, means standing place, home, country, or ground. We have a standing place in Yahweh in the rock, which we know in this uh, wording here is hatsur, which means the rock. And I want to just look at a couple of places here when we see the rendering of the word esteem and we're able to see it from Scripture the revelation of the esteem of Yahweh. Because now we're saying, what does this mean? Well, through Scripture, we see a revealing of what this esteem of Yahweh means. And we take note of the striking words of Messiah when he spoke to the Pharisees, who were accusing the taught ones of breaking the Sabbath when taking the grains of the field, when walking through the grain fields and plucking them and eating the heads of grain. He says in Matit Yohu 12, verse 6, But I say to you, in this place there is one greater than the set-apart place. And this is what he was telling them. In other words, he was saying, the one who is bigger than the house is in this place. And we see in the book of Hebrews, it says, this one has been deemed worthy of more esteem than Moshe. 
As much as he who built the house enjoys more respect than the house, for every house is built by someone. But he who built all is Elohim. And Moshe indeed was trustworthy in all his house as a servant for a witness of what would be spoken later. But Messiah as a son over his, his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast to the boldness and the boasting of the expectation firm to the end. To the end. So Elohim is builder of the house. So in other words, Yeshua was basically telling the Pharisees, Elohim is in your midst, you know. And Yeshiyahu 40 verse 5 says, The esteem of Yahweh shall be revealed, and all flesh together shall see it, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. And in Yeshiyahu 40 verse 9 to 11, it says, You who bring the good news to Zion, get up into the high mountain, you who bring the good news to Jerusalem." Lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Yehuda, see your Elohim. See, the master Yahweh comes with a strong hand and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He feeds his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs with his arm and carries them in his bosom, gently leading those who are with young. This prophecy of the esteem of Yahweh being revealed, we are told that the one who brings the good news to Tion would say to the cities of Tion, see your Elohim. Very important part, because Yochanan 1 verse 23, when Yochanan was asked by the Pharisees, are you the Messiah? He says, no, I'm not the Messiah. See, I'm a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of Yahweh, as the prophet Yeshiyahu said. And then we see in verse 29 of John 1, he says, on the next day, Yochanan saw Yeshua coming toward him, and he said, see the Lamb of Elohim. He who takes away the sins of the world. And this was a clear fulfillment of the prophecy where he's basically saying, see your Elohim. You know? In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, it says, For Elohim who said, let light shine out of darkness, is the one, listen to this, who has shone in our hearts for the enlightening of the knowledge of the esteem of Elohim in the face of Yehoshua Messiah. Now, how many times you've read that over and not really understood it in the context? In other words, the Lamb of Elohim is Elohim. The Lamb is the lamp, the one who shines, the one who reveals the esteem of Yahweh in the face of Yeshua Messiah. That's why Yeshiyahu 60 verse 1 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The esteem of Yahweh has risen upon you. You know, Yeshua 42 verse 8, Yahweh says, I am Yahweh, that is my name, and my esteem I do not give to another, nor praise to idols. So when we, I'm, I'm mentioning these things here because I want you to see a powerful picture of the esteem of Yahweh. Because Yeshua said he is the good shepherd, he lays down his life for the sheep, and Yeshiyahu in prophesying, see your Elohim, is the one that shepherds the flock. And then he's the light of the world, arise, shine, your light has come. So we see all these things coming to pass, reading the renewed writings and reading Revelation and reading Yochanan's description of Messiah. How do you read that in the face of Moshe's question, let me see your esteem? So when you throw away the Torah, you'll never understand what Shaul is writing to the Corinthians, the, the knowledge of the understanding of the esteem of Yahweh in the face of Elohim, in the face of Yeshua Messiah. Yochanan 12 in verse 36 to 41 says, While you have the light, believe in the light so that you become sons of light. These words Yehoshua spoke and went off and was hidden from them. But though he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. That the word of Yeshiyahu the prophet might be filled when he spoke. Yahweh who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? Because of this they were unable to believe because again Yeshiyahu said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they should not see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I should heal them. Yeshiyahu said this when he saw his esteem and spoke of him. So Yeshiyahu, when he saw Yahweh seated on the throne, he saw him in the fullness of his position, position as creator, sovereign of all creation, seated on his throne in the heavenlies. Seeing the cherubim around his throne saying, set apart, set apart, set apart, Yahweh El Shaddai. This word for revealed in Yeshua 40 verse 5, when it says the esteem of Yahweh shall be revealed is gala, which means to uncover, to be uncovered or to reveal oneself. And Yahweh revealed himself to Shemuel the prophet, same word that's used. So again, 
shall got to see Yahweh, you know. And in Shemuel Aleph chapter 4, when the esteem of Yahweh departed from Israel because they were corrupt and the Ark of the Witness went into Philistine captivity, we are told when the esteem of Yahweh was removed, um, Eli's son's wife said she called the child when she gave birth, Ichavot, saying the esteem of Yahweh the esteem has departed from Israel because the ark of Elohim was taken and because of her father-in-law and husband. And she said, the esteem has departed from Israel for the ark of Elohim was taken. That word for departed also comes from the root word gala. And it highlights again, depending on the tense and context, that the same root word can either mean reveal or to depart. So it's either discovered or unclosed or it's removed. Disclosed, unclosed. Disclosed or removed, you know. The name of Ichavot means no esteem because Kavot is obviously esteem. Ichavot is no esteem. So the covering of the hand of Yahweh had been removed from his house. Okay, so we understand clearly why I'm going through this picture of the esteem. In Tehillah 102 verse 16, it says, Yahweh shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his esteem. So already when his esteem departed, there was always this expectation that he will appear in his esteem again. And with his esteem being in their presence, they would have protection from their enemies. And when Messiah comes again with all his messengers, we are told that we'll see his face and the fullness of his esteem. Yochanan Aleph chapter 3 verse 2 says, Beloved ones, now we are children of Elohim, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In other words, we will see him in the fullness of his esteem. And in Corinthians, we are told when one turns to the master, the, the veil is taken away, you know. And in Corinthians 13, we're also told, 1 Corinthians 13, for now we see as in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know as also I have been known. How awesome is that? We have the same desire that Moshe, I mean, we're seeing the characteristics because the face in the face of Yahweh is also in his countenance or characteristic the character and nature of who Yahweh is we see him in the word we're seeing dimly but one day we will see him face to face that fullness that Moshe yearned to see him in although he did speak to him face to face you know Yochanan 1 here's an important verse that's so critical that many people have lost it verse 14 in chapter 1 of John and the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us, and we saw his esteem. The esteem as of a only brought forth of a father, complete in favor and truth. So the Greek word for as or in as of is hos, which means as like or even as. In other words, when Messiah came here, that's how we saw the esteem of Yahweh. And that's I don't like, I like to say, but I don't like to say. It's almost like that's as good as it gets. Because that's how we're going to see him. That's how we're going to relate to him. You know? In 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, it says, Beyond all question, the secret of reverence is great. Elohim was revealed in the flesh. I just revealed a verse to you in Yeshayahu, see your Elohim, the esteem of Elohim being revealed. Elohim was revealed in the flesh, declared right in the spirit, was seen by messengers, was proclaimed among nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in esteem. When he went up after 40 days after his resurrection, before his taught ones on the Mount of Olives, and they said, see, this same Yehoshua Messiah that you've seen going away is coming in the same way. The cloud rider is returning. Zechariah 9 verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. See, your sovereign is coming to you. He is righteous and endowed with deliverance, humble and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So when Messiah came riding on that donkey, this was fulfillment. See, your sovereign. Here is the esteem of Yahweh in the face of Yeshua Messiah.
want to give three more verses in terms of esteem. Titus 2 verse 11 to 14 says, The saving gift of Elohim has appeared to all men, instructing us to renounce wickedness and worldly lusts and to live sensibly, righteously, and reverently in the present age, looking for the blessed expectation and esteemed appearance of our great Elohim and Savior, Yehoshua Messiah who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people, his own possession, ardent for good works. And in Chazon 21, verse 23, after the fullness of the revelation of Messiah has been given to Yochanan, it's it's told here very clear in the city, the renewed Jerusalem, the city had no need of the sun nor of the moon to shine in it, for the esteem of Elohim lightened it, and the lamb is its lamp. In other words, that's the esteem that we see in the face of Yeshua Messiah, the Lamb of Elohim. And in Chazon 22, verse 3 to 5, And no longer shall there be any curse, and the throne of Elohim and the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. His name shall be upon their foreheads, and night shall be no more, and they shall have no need for a lamp of the, or the light of the sun, because Yahweh Elohim shall give them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. What we can take from this is that what Moshe asked for that day, in the light of the face of Yeshua Messiah, it has been revealed to us. And we see it dimly now as in a mirror when we look intently into the word. His arm has been revealed. He is mighty to save. He covers us, his house, securing for us the promise of an eternal entrance into his reign to be with him forever. This is the blessed expectation, the esteemed appearance that we long for. Anybody want to ask any questions on the esteem of Yahweh, or does it make sense? Moshe says, if, if you don't go, I don't go. And that should be our attitude in everything. We are to be led forth in peace, you know. Yochanan Aleph, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't give you the verse, but I did quote it in chapter 3, verse 6. He says, everyone staying in him does not sin. Everyone sinning has neither seen him nor known him. In other words, stay in him, don't go off on your own. Stay in the master, keep walking in him, and you'll have his esteem being continually revealed more and more. Anybody want to share before we jump into chapter 34? Who'd like to read chapter 34? Okay. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I shall write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. And be ready in the morning. Then you shall come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And let no man come up with you, and let no man be seen in all the mountain, and let not even the flock or the herd feed in front of that mountain. And he cut two tablets of stone, like the first ones. Then Moshe rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai, as Yahweh had commanded him, and he took two tablets of stone in his hand. And Yahweh came down in the cloud, and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name Yahweh. And Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh an owl compassionate and showing favor, patient and great in loving commitment and truth, watching over over loving commitment for thousands, forgiving crookedness and transgression and sin, but by no means leaving unpunished, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moshe hurried and bowed himself toward the earth and did obeisance and said, If now I have found favor in your eyes, O Yahweh, I pray, let Yahweh go on in our midst, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and forgive our crookedness and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. And he said, See, I am making a covenant. Before all your people I am going to do wonders, such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of Yahweh, for what I am doing with you is awesome. Guard what I command you today. See, I am driving out from before you the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Guard yourself, 
lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. But break down their swords of places, and smash their pillars, and cut down their ushering. For you do not bow yourselves to another mighty one. For Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous owl. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they whore after their mighty ones, and slaughter to their mighty ones. And one of them invites you, and you eat of his slaughterings. And you take off his daughters for your sons, and his daughters whore after their mighty ones, and make your sons whore after their mighty ones. Do not make a molded mighty one for yourselves. Guard the festival of Matzot. For seven days you eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you in the appointed time of the new moon of Aviv, because in the new moon of Aviv you came out from Mitzrayim. Everyone opening the womb is mine, and every male firstborn among your livestock, whether bull or sheep. But the firstborn of a donkey you ransom with a lamb, and if you do not ransom, then you shall break his neck. Every firstborn of your sons you shall ransom, and they shall not appear before me empty-handed. Six days you work, but on the seventh day you rest. In ploughing time and in harvest you rest. And perform this festival of Shavuot for yourself, of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the festival of ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times in the year all your men are to appear before the Master Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel. For I dispossess nations before you, and shall enlarge your borders, and let no one covet your land when you go up to appear before Yahweh your Elohim three times in a year. Do not slay the blood of my slaughterings with leaven, and do not let the slaughtering of the festival of the Pesach remain until morning. Bring the first of the first fruits of your land to the house of Yahweh your Elohim. Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Write these words. For according to the mouth of these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. And he was there with Yahweh forty days and forty nights. He did not eat bread and he did not drink water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the ten words. And it came to be when Moshe came down from Mount Sinai, while the two tablets of the witness were in Moshe's hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moshe did not know that the skin of his face shone since he had spoken with him. And Aharon and all the children of Israel looked at Moshe and saw the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moshe called out to them, and Aharon and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moshe spoke to them. And afterward all the children of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that Yahweh had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moshe ended speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moshe went in before Yahweh to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out, he spoke to the children of Israel what he had been commanded. And the children of Israel would see the face of Moshe, that the skin of Moshe's face shone. And Moshe would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. So this chapter basically highlights the terms of the covenant being reinstated. In other words, they entered the covenant when they said, I do. They broke that, and Moshe broke the tablets of stone, got new tablets, went up, came down again, and basically this was reinstated. And when Yahweh already told Moshe in the previous chapter, I will come down and proclaim my name, we see in this chapter Yahweh doing that very thing. When he proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh, compassionate, forgiving, crookedness, you know. And this must have been quite an awesome moment. It, this is one of those Selah moments in Scripture where instead of just reading over, just stop and picture the scene. After all that's gone on, Yahweh comes down in the esteem of the cloud and he himself proclaims his name. You know? When Yahushua came, he proclaimed the name of Yahweh and they did not receive him. He even said in Yochanan 5, I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. Another comes in his own name and him you receive. And this what we see here in Shemot is a prophetic shadow picture of how Yahweh would indeed come down and proclaim his name as he came to proclaim deliverance. And these words of Yehoshua in Yochanan 5, we can see clear proof that Yehoshua is indeed Elohim, you know, proclaiming his name. And when Yahweh came down in a cloud and stood over Moshe to proclaim his name, we're able to see another shadow picture again when we see this event taking place in the renewed writings in Luke 9 when it says, and he was saying this, 
A cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, the beloved, hear him. And when the voice had spoken, Yehoshua was found alone. And they were silent and reported to the one in those days. They reported to no one in those days any of what they had seen. Because it was like, what's going on here? This was when Kepha, Yochanan, and Yaakov went with Messiah. And this is where Moshe and Eliyahu appeared. And when they heard this in this cloud, and they heard this voice, and they looked, and all they saw was Yeshua Messiah. You know? The voice had spoken, and all that the emissaries saw was Yeshua Messiah. And so Yahweh came down before these three witnesses and proclaimed his name. What a powerful moment. This is another shadow picture of the reinstatement of the covenant. You know, a, a fulfillment of the renewal of the covenant that was being made because of the loving commitment. El compassionate. Yahweh and El who is compassionate, showing loving commitment and kindness. You know. And so... We see a powerful witness here as we look at who our compassionate Elohim is. He makes it very clear. This is what you do now. You now do not make any images. What did they do? They still went and did it. You know, Guard yourself lest you make a covenant with those of the land that you're going into. Destroy all their things. This is a wonderful witness that we also need to realize is what does the dwelling place of Yahweh have with idols? You can't mix your worship because it's corrupt, false worship. Do not bow yourselves to another mighty one. Yahweh is jealous, you know. Because if you do, if you go and practice practices of that which is not according to Yahweh's design, you are stirring up his jealous wrath. And you will end up whoring away with the people. That's a guarantee, you know. And then he says, the way, that, the way I see this, the way Moshe has given it to us, is this is the remedy to guard against making idols or doing what the nations do and joining with them, is guarding his feasts. And he lays it out here. Matzot, this is when you came out of Mitzrayim and Aviv. You, the firstborn is mine. You ransom the firstborn. Perform the festival of Shavuot, the first fruits. Again, here's a witness. First fruits is Shavuot. It's not Matzot. And then the Feast of Ingathering, the Sukkot, the Harvest Feast, you know. And you don't appear before Yahweh empty-handed. You come before him with the gift of your hand. We've spoke about that every time we come to the cyclical pattern of the feasts and rehearsals. We're reminded why we're doing this, because we've been guarded against following the ways of the nations so that we hold and retain the expectation of his esteemed appearance. You know. And when Moshe came out of the tent, obviously Yehoshua remained in the tent as well, but when Moshe came and they saw his face shining, Moshe didn't know his face was shining so much. He didn't cover his face and speak to them. He spoke to them, and once the word had been spoken, he covered his face. It's almost like this is the picture that I get, because he, he remained covered, went to speak to Yahweh, came out, spoke to him, covered his face. This was the pattern. So in other words, the only things that Moshe would now speak to the people was Yahweh's word. You know, and then we, we see in uh, Corinthians, Shaul making it clear to us, highlighting what we have in the Master. I just want to get to that. Sorry, there are lots of things in the notes here for you to go through that I haven't mentioned today. Um, having then such expectation, we use much boldness of speech. This is in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 12 to 18. And not like Moshe, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel should not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when the old covenant is being read, that same veil remains, not lifted because in Messiah it is taken away. But to this day, when Moshe is being read, a veil lies on their heart. And when one turns to the master, the veil is taken away. Now Yahweh is the spirit, and where the spirit of Yahweh is, there is freedom. As we all, as with unveiled face, we see as in a mirror the esteem of Yahweh. As being transformed into the same likeness from esteem to esteem as from Yahweh the Spirit. How awesome is that? When we follow him and walk as we walk, we get to see more than what the people saw in the days of Moshe. Those that aren't turning to the master, they're still avail no matter what they hear. 
there still remains a veil because it's the hardness of their heart that's not allowing them to see the esteem of Yahweh and allow his likeness in us to grow from esteem to esteem, you know. We are to shine as lights in the world. The light, the esteem of Yahweh, arise, shine, your light has come. The esteem of Yahweh has risen upon you. Therefore, we are not to hide our lamp. We are to let it shine. So let them see our good works. We don't cover our works. We let them see our good works so that they esteem Elohim in the day of his visitation. You know? The Hebrew word that's translated as shone, when Moshe's face shone, comes from the verb karan, which means to send out rays, to shine, to emit light rays. And it can also carry the meaning of to be with horns. Because remember I said the horns is like the shining one, the, that strength. And what's worth taking note of is that, that, that that's where we get the horn, which is, means strength or might, is keren, from this root word karan, which is to shine. The other thing that we realize in Tehillah 18 verse 2, it says, Yahweh is my rock and my refuge. That's the place that we have with him. He is our rock. My El is my rock. I take refuge in him. My shield and the horn of my deliverance. My high tower. Moshe is shown the very strength and power of Elohim before a nation. And we can learn a great deal as we recognize the strength and courage that we can find in our master when making the sure, bold confession of who we follow and who we serve, standing firm in him. You know, having a daily quiet time in our master's presence is critical. It gives one great strength to face the battles of life and it enables one to fight the good fight of the belief with much boldness as one that's been counted and must, the one that has been mustered up, so, so to speak, that's been called up for service so that we can make our boast and praise in Elohim. When you are counted, then you must know it will cost you your all. And that's what this Torah portion that we've looked at today is all about, is when you lift up the head, when you count the heads, when you take a register of the peoples. We have all been atoned for by the blood of Messiah. We need to shine like it. And we don't have a veil over our face, as Moshe did after speaking. We are boldly declaring in everything that we do the word of our Master. Anybody want to share their thoughts on today's readings? I know it's been a bit longer than usual. But... And we can go to 1 Kings, Melachim Aleph, chapter 18. <coughs> We'd like to read. Nobody? Hmm? Yeah. And after many days it came to me that the word of Yahweh came to Eliyahu in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I gave and I give rain on the earth. Thereupon Eliyahu went to present himself to Ahab. And the scarcity of food in Shamaron was severe. And Ahab had called Avadjahu, who was over his house. Now Avadjahu feared Yahweh exceedingly. And it came to be, while Isabel cut down the prophets of Yahweh, that Avadjahu had taken one hundred prophets and hidden them, fifty to a cave, and had fed them with bread and water. And Ahab had said to Avadjahu, Go into the land, to all the springs of water, and go to all the wadis. It could be that we find grass to keep the horses and mules alive and not have any livestock cut off. And they divided the land between them to pass over it. Ahab went one, went one way by himself, and Avadjahu went another way by himself. And as Avadjahu was on his way, then see, Eliyahu met him, and he recognized him, and fell on his face and said, Is that you, my master Eliyahu? And he answered him, It is I. Go so say to your master, Eliyahu is here. And he said, what have I sinned that you are giving your servant to the, into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As Yahweh your Elohim lives, there is no nation or reign where my master has not sent to look for you. And when they said, He is not here, he made the reign or nation swear that they could not find you. 
And now you say, Go, say to your master, Eliyahu is here. And it shall be, as soon as I am gone from you, that the Spirit of Yahweh takes you away to a place I do not know. And I shall come to report to Ahab, and when he does not find you, he shall kill me. But I, your servant, have feared Yahweh from my, from my youth. Was it not reported to my master what I did, when Isabel killed the prophets of Yahweh? How I hid one hundred men of the prophets of Yahweh, fifty to a cave, and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, Go, say to your master, Eliyahu is here, then he shall kill me. And Eliyahu said, As Yahweh of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I shall indeed show myself to him today. Ovajahu then went to meet Ahab and informed him, and Ahab went to meet Eliyahu. And it came to be, when Ahab saw Eliyahu, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O disturber of Israel? And he answered, I have not disturbed Israel, but you and your father's house, in that you have forsaken the commands of Yahweh, and you have followed the Baals. And now, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the four hundred and fifty prophets of Baal, and the four hundred prophets of Asherah, who eat at Isabel's table. Ahab then sent for all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets on Mount Carmel. And Eliyahu came to all the people and said, How long would you keep hopping between two opinions? If Yahweh is Elohim, follow him, and if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. And Eliyahu said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of Yahweh, but the prophets of Baal are four hundred and fifty men. Now let them give us two bulls, and let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but set no fire. And I, I prepare the other bull, and shall lay it on the wood, but set no fire. And you shall call on the name of your mighty one, and I, I call on the name of Yahweh. And the Elohim answers by fire, he is Elohim. So all the people answered and said, The word is good. And Eliyahu said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bull for yourselves, and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your mighty one, but set no fire. So they took the bull which was given to them, and prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even, from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered, and they leaped about the slaughter place which they had made. And it came to be at noon that Eliyahu taunted them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a mighty one. He is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey, or it could be that he is asleep and has to be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves according to their ruling, with knives and spears, until the blood gushed out on them. And it came to be when midday was past that they prophesied until the time of bringing the evening offering. But there was no voice, and no one answered, and no one paying attention. Then Eliyahu said to all the people, Come closer to me. And all the people came closer to him. And he repaired the slaughter place of Yahweh that was broken down. And Eliyahu took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Yaakov, to whom the word of Yahweh had come, saying, Israel is your name. And with the stones he built a slaughter place in the name of Yahweh. And he made a trench around the slaughter place large enough to hold two sayers of seed. And he arranged the wood and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood and laid it on the wood and said, Fill four jars of water and pour it on the ascending offering and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water flowed around the slaughter place, and he filled the trench with water too. And it came to be, at the time of bringing the evening offering, that Eliyahu the prophet came near and said, Yahweh Elohim of Avram, Yitzchak, and Israel, let it be known today, you are Elohim in Israel, and I, your servant, have done all these matters by your word. Answer me, O Yahweh, answer me, and let this people know that you are Yahweh Elohim, and you shall turn their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of Yahweh fell and consumed the ascending offering, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And all the people saw, and fell on their faces, and said, Yahweh, He is the Elohim. Yahweh, He is the Elohim. Okay, so this passage that we're quite familiar with, I think, hopefully, one of the big encounters that we refer to quite a lot in Scripture is this contending on Mount Carmel between the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Isabel, 850 of them collectively against Eliyahu, you know, and so we see what I, what I, the couple of things that I like here to stand out is how what how the world views 
Yahweh's people. Ahab comes along and calls Eliyahu disturber of Israel. You know, I mean, Israel obviously were following Isabel's ways in Baal worship. And so, yes, he was a disturber of Israel actually in their eyes because he was disturbing their ways. But in the bigger scheme of things, Ahab was the disturber of Israel, falling prey to wrong worship. And so when they gathered together on Mount Carmel, I mean, it's, you read this here and you've got to think, how stupid are these people whipping themselves, cutting themselves, blood gushing out? You know, and Eliyahu's taunting them. Don't just shout a little louder. Isn't he sleeping? Was he gone on a journey? You know, wake him up. What's happening? They must have been getting quite angry with Eliyahu. But the confidence that Eliyahu had to have to stand here as a man of Elohim, you know, and he repairs the slaughter place of Yahweh, taking 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel, takes the four things of water three times, again, a picture of the, representing the fullness of Israel. He drenches his slaughtering and slaughter place, and Yahweh answers with fire, and the people cry out, Yahweh hu ha Elohim, Yahweh hu ha Elohim. That's what they said. That's exactly what they said, okay? Yahweh hu ha Elohim, Yahweh hu ha Elohim. He is Elohim. He is the Elohim, okay? There was a big hoo-ha going on, yes. It was a declaration that Yahweh is Elohim. And he said, choose today who you're going to serve. And when the people saw this, but why is it that people must first see the fire of Elohim before they choose him? And so we see a powerful picture here. I mean, I don't know if anybody wants to share on this, but this is an event that we've spoken at length of a number of times. Ovat Yahu, who was the one guy that was protecting the prophets of Yahweh, his name means servant of Yahweh, you know. And he provided them with bread and water in a time of famine. So it shows again as a witness to us in the end days when there's a famine for the word, the word's readily, readily available. But even in famine times, physically or spiritually, Yahweh in this tense hi highlights for us that he provides for his people. And therefore, we hear the words of our master that says, do not worry about what you eat, what you wear, and where you shall sleep. Because the nations worry about those things. But our master, our father, knows what we need, you know. This was a big event that I think is, when we look at the spirit of Eliyahu must come first before the master, the spirit of Eliyahu, which is also uh, recognized through the works of Yochanan the Immerser, that proclaimed a repentance, a calling back to Yahweh and an immersion, a, an impen, a re, immersion of repentance, we see even in these days before our master's coming back, this spirit of re, calling for people to return is happening again and calling for people to make a clear choice. And that responsibility lies with every single one of us as servants of Yahweh because the spirit and the bride say come. So we have a role to play, like Eliyahu against the eight. And it might be like you go out and you feel like you're against everybody or everybody's against you. That's true. But that shouldn't stop you in calling on the name of Yahweh to show himself strong on your behalf. But if you want him to do that, you need to be making sure that you are standing firm in him and repairing a proper slaughter place, so to speak, a proper place where, or, or life of worship that... When you've been counted in him and, and registered in him, it's your all. Nothing else but your all. No, it's once you've accepted his salvation, you're, you, you're in. You're in. And then you've spent your life, I mean, that, in his skills, it's the shows the compassion of Yahweh. It's like, the minute you repent, he forgets. Yes. And, and you're... But the, the flip side of the coin is the moment you sin, you're out of his will. Yeah. If you die, then you're lost. Yeah. I mean, so it's, we cannot bank on past hours. We no. live every hour yes. completely to him. Yeah. Because, no. Don't let your guard down. That's no. a, a clear witness, you know. He's forever sending up people to remind 
Okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians and then 2 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians 8 will be verses that we've already kind of touched on, so it's really just summing up our readings today. That's it, 1 Corinthians 8. Okay, you're going to read? No. So then, concerning the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol is no matter at all in the world, and there is no other Elohim but one. For even if there are so-called mighty ones, whether in heaven or, or on earth, as there are mighty ones and many masters, for us there is one Elohim, the Father from whom all came and for whom we live, and one Master, Yeshua Messiah, through whom all came and through whom we live. However, not all have this knowledge, but some, being aware of the idol, until now, eat it as having been offered to an idol. So their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food does not com commend us to Elohim, for we are none the better if we eat, nor any worse for not eating. But look to it, lest somehow this right of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's place, shall not his conscience, if he is weak, be built up to eat food offered to idols? So this weak brother, for whom Messiah died, shall perish through your knowledge. Now sinning in this way against the brothers, and wounding their weak conscience, you sin against Messiah. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I am never again going to eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Okay, so Shaul's just addressing this concern that was happening in, in Corinthian uh, assembly was that people were still mixing their worship and they were going off and doing other things that the nations were doing or the other people in Corinth that weren't serving Yahweh and they would go and sit at their feast tables and they would go partake in their festivals and they would eat food that's offered to idols that's done in there and he's basically saying yes we serve one Elohim there is now the mighty one so our conscience is clear but now how are you going to get a new convert a new believer if he sees you partaking with the others because you know that it's not there's nothing there but you're there doing what they do How's that going to help a new believer? So therefore, when he says, if, if, if it means I don't eat meat, it doesn't mean he's never going to eat meat again. He's talking about the practice of, I'm not going to go associate with those people again if it means to help my brother come to the truth. So this is a clear witness about partaking in the things of this world that we should not be partaking of because we serve Yahweh. And we need to keep our lives as a witness to others because people are always looking. So if we are, you know, we must never think, oh, no, I can go here because I'm not witnessing to anybody now. It's we're always witnessing of Yahweh. And we must be on guard against not doing what the nations do, you know. Because if someone sees you eating in an idol's place, why would you be there in the first place? You shouldn't be there. And we can take this down to, because what, when, when we read this, when it says there's one Elohim, the Father from whom we all came and from whom we live, and one Master Yeshua through whom all came and through whom all live. So it's a clear picture again that Yahweh is one. But some, having believed the idol, what's the idol? It's this idol idea of a separation of Father and Son, two different entities. And so some that are still weak, not understanding that Yahweh is Yeshua Messiah, or Yeshua Messiah is Yahweh our Savior, they are partaking in other practices. You talk about Trinity doctrines and things like that. Let's bring it closer to home. We're not going to go and partake in things with people that are engaging in, in worship of Trinity. Okay? Because we know Yahweh is one, so I'm not going to sit there because another guy that's been there and you say, but you're sitting there too, so you say you don't agree, but you're there. I'm confused. No, well, we had a lady that said she took a pastor on for having a, not keeping the Sabbath, but she was at a function that they were having on the yes. Sabbath. <laughs> yeah. And we're like, okay, well, you just broke your whole witness. Yeah. What were you doing there? You can't be pointing at him. When you're not doing what the yeah. word says. But I mean, the word does say we mustn't partake in, when 
they offered you their idols, you don't share yes. that food. Yeah. And this makes it, uh, we know there is no such thing as an idol, so they didn't offer to anything. But for the sake of their conscience, yes. like he says in the other places, you don't partake. Because it must be a witness against them yes. for what they're doing wrong. Because, I mean, I, like, my example is, I don't eat that sperm because they have totem poles and eagles that Indians worship. So mm. I'm not going to go sit there. I know those things are not real. But I don't like to sit next to a thing that somebody yeah. worshipped and now they're giving me food. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just my personal thing. That's how I interpret this. Yeah. But for me, that's a good example. Yeah. So, if a restaurant has an idol at their door, I don't go eat yeah. it there. I'd rather go to a restaurant, restaurant that doesn't have an idol. Yeah. I know there aren't other mighty ones. Yes. Just because I know there's only yeah. Yahweh. And it's, and it's also the witness that we have amongst young believers that see. And they say, because the problem is if a young believer sees you eating in an idol's place, they might think, oh, but it's okay. Then they can actually do it. And they don't have self-control or self-will. And they give themselves over to things that they shouldn't have done. So we always have to be aware of our witness. And it's like Kadin said with the other passages that Shoal writes of in Corinthians, etc., is also about... We know that our conscience is clear. It's not, we're not, oh, we can't eat that because we're not afraid of the things there. But for the sake of a witness and the conscience of those doing it and those that might be watching, we guard our lives in complete separation and set apartness so that we're always witnessing, coming back to the fragrance of Messiah again. You know? Everybody understand that? Any questions? Everybody clear? Then we've got 2 Corinthians 3. Verse 1 to 18. Henry. Jackie. Jackie, sorry. Are we to begin to recommend ourselves again or do we need as some letters of recommendation to you or form you or from you you are our letter having been written in our hearts known and read by all men making it obvious that you are a letter of messiah served by us written not with ink but by the spirit of the living elohim not on tablets of stone but on fleshly tablets of the heart and just and such trust we have towards elohim through the messiah not that we are competent in ourselves to reckon any matter as from ourselves, but our competence is from Elohim, who also made us competent as servants of a renewed covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills by the spirit is life. But if the administering of death in letters engraved on stones was esteemed, so that the children of Israel were unable to look steadily at the face of Moshe because of the esteem of his face, which was passing away, how much more esteemed shall the administering of the Spirit not be? For if the administering of condemnation had esteem, the administering of righteousness exceeds much more in esteem. For indeed what was made esteemed had no esteem in this respect in view of the esteem that excels. For if that which is passing away was esteemed, much more that which remains in esteem. Having then such expectation, we use much boldness of speech, and not like Moshe who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel should not look steadily at the end of what, what, what was passing away, but their minds were hardened. For to this day when the old covenant is being read, that same veil remains not lifted, because in Moshe it is taken away. Uh, but their minds were hardened. For to this day when the old covenant is being read, that same veil remains not lifted, because in Messiah it is taken away. But to this day, when Moshe is being read, a veil lies on their heart. And when one turns to the Master, the veil is taken away. Now Yahweh is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of Yahweh is, there is freedom. And we all, as with unveiled face, we see as in a mirror the esteem of Yahweh, are being transformed into the same likeness, from esteem to esteem, as from Yahweh the Spirit. I like the ending of that chapter as from Yahweh the Spirit, you know, again. 
We spoke at the end of this about the end of the chapter and Moshe's face being covered and how we now with boldness, with unveiled faces, are making known who our master is. But what strikes me at the beginning of this chapter is his appeal to them saying, you are letters. You've seen our life. You know, we, we don't need to recommend ourselves. We don't need to prove ourselves to you again. But you, you've seen the way we've lived. You now know who the master is. He's written his word on your heart. You are letters. You are our letters. You, you, this is one thing that we have to ask our lives, you know, or ask ourselves in our lives. Is ask our lives. We have to ask ourselves. What is written on our hearts? What is written on our hearts? We who believe in the Master. It's his Torah, right? Then we are to live like it. We are to be a letter of Messiah. We should be able to be read by others and they see his word. How's that going for you? That's a question you can answer before the face of the Master. Because we see here our competency is not in ourselves, it's in our master. He's the one who makes us competent for such a task, you know. And so let us keep shining. This is an encouragement today that we have been counted worthy, registered in our master. Let's go out there and not be like little children that need milk, milk, milk the whole time, throwing tantrums because we're not getting our way. But let us grow up in the master so that we can help those tantruming toddlers grow up to maturity and feed on the meat of the word, you know. Anybody want to share their thoughts on what we've read today? I hope you don't feel like we're rushing through Shaul's readings here because we've discussed this quite at length through the Torah, you know. And I think it's always a wow factor for me to come to the renewed writings, readings, and read it and go, okay, that's fine, that makes sense, that's good, it all, all ties in nicely now. But reading this without the Torah, you can, you can orchestrate or come up with so many doctrines of man, you know. Any thoughts on today? Renee, any questions? Are you still on the line with us there, please? Any questions? No, where's Renee? He's not on anymore. No, no. He's on his phone. Okay. Well, Renee, you can send me a WhatsApp if you want to ask a question. Streaming from his phone. <laughs> Streaming from his phone. Yes, he's... <laughs> okay. Any family online would like to share any closing thoughts or encouragements? You're welcome to do so. We'll give a moment as we're going to close off now. It was a bit of a longer afternoon session. But we've got all Shabbat. We can do a shawl and go right the way through if you like. <laughs> Maybe there's a few of you. You look like you're ready to fall off your seat, not out of the window, but off your seat. But <laughs> we'll revive you. Um, the, this, this section is my favourite. I just like the cry of all our hearts must be that if Yahweh isn't going with us, we're not going. Yeah. Because how will they know that we are His people if He's not with? Yeah. That, that isn't that the point. The point isn't get the prosperity or the whatever or the safety or the whatever you think the promised land. It's not the promised land if you're always not there. Yeah. No. The point is his presence. Yes. That's what it's all about. It's the very thing that mankind was expelled from. And it's the very thing that the redeemed man will return to. Because it's all about his presence. Annie from Texas is saying Shabbat Shalom, love, love. <laughs> Good to have you online with us. We're about to finish. I hope that you've joined us earlier in because every time you say Shabbat Shalom, it's almost like when we're ending. But uh, I'm sure you'll watch the recordings of earlier one later. You know, just as Kalina is saying, we go through this week in, week out, and, and it, it really is about Yahweh's presence being with us. And how much, I mean, that's why we... We should be putting in all this effort, all this. It's, it's, we just read in, in 1 Corinthians, or even in, um, 2 Corinthians, if that which was administered on stones had much esteem, how much more the righteousness of esteem in the spirit of Yahweh, how much more? It's like, the, it's like we can't say, you know, the standard, is, I mean, Yahweh shows no partiality, so it's always been the same standard of set of partners, Annie's saying, being here, smiley face. Good, thanks, Annie. 
But we do recognize there is a greater responsibility, and that's why in Acts, Yahweh says at one time he overlooked ignorance, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent. Because even in the book of um, Amos, when the plumb line was set, after all the judgments that he was shown, oh, and Yahweh relented. Again, not that he changed his mind, but he was showing the prophet through Yahweh's eyes, like Moshe, how depraved the people are. And when he set a plumb line, he said, now I will not relent. So when he came in the flesh and we saw the esteem as of a brought forth of a father, that is it. We cannot plead ignorance. We cannot. That's why anybody today that says, but I didn't know, that, that's not an excuse, actually. Read. Yes. Well, if you can't read and you've got ears, there's still no excuse. Yeah. I'm saying, I mean, they, the witness that they got was in the most set apart place with Yahweh. Yeah. I mean, just think about it. Yeah. We have it in our hands. Yes. We have no excuse. No. And how awesome that is, actually. You know, especially in these days that are getting darker and the darkness is getting thicker, that's over the people's. How awesome it is that we get to shine the light and be letters of Messiah. That you cannot be read as letters of Messiah if Yahweh is not with you. <laughs> That's another thing too, you know. Okay, so where is he? Oh, well, he was here. Um, yeah, no, I was with him. No, he's either with you or he's not with you. <laughs> so. Renee did confirm that he's on... Not on his phone, he's watching on his phone. Yes. Okay, Renee. <laughs> Don't be on your phone when things say, yes, Renee, you can be on watching, it's fine. <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, that, I, I just think I hope you've had a good meal today in the Master's Word because it really is a great buffet of goodness that we've had today in his Word, recognizing what we've been given in him and, and just taking the good with the warning too, because just like those in the wilderness that were blotted out because of their disregard for the esteem of Yahweh, as we go through the Psalms, we, say, we, we see how we are to give him esteem and bring esteem to his name. The way we do that is by being a correct letter and letting our lives be read correctly. Because if it's read from a muddied point of view, we are actually blaspheming his name and not esteeming his name. So let's go out and be good letters of our master, amen? As with unveiled faces, no hidden agents here. Just shine, shine, shine. Hallelujah. Okay, Henry, would you like to pray for us? We're going to pass the mic to you. Thank you, Master, for the message that we, that we gained from your word today. Father, would you strengthen us to be your light and to show others out there what, what you are about for us and what you are doing in our lives. Father, would you also, as I go on my journey next week, protect me and also strengthen me so that I can, I can stand um, in the outslaws that I might get on, on my way. Father, I pray this all in your name. In the name of Yeshua. Amen.